Acoustic control of low-end frequency is probably the most difficult thing to achieve, yet it is mandatory if you are making music with lots of low-end. Why? Because your room will work like a frequency cancellator. This has nothing to do with your speakers, but just with the geometry of your room and with physics, with what we call model frequency. These are frequency that are as a certain a multiple of the length of your room, and that will be cancelling out each other or boosting the level. Don't take my word for granted, just turn on your favorite synthesizer, play a sine wave, low end frequency and walk around in your room and you will hear how the level that you will perceive will change drastically depending on the position you are standing at. This means that if this is happening when you walk through the room, what is the sound really worse at your listening position. Are you in a dip? Are you in a peak? Are you at the right position? Hello audio wizards and dear music makers. Today we're going to cover different approaches to control low end. Some of them are costing nothing, it's just about your own placement in the room. So without any further ado, let's dive into the first technique that won't cost you anything. Place one of your speakers in a corner. You want to place the speaker in the corner to spread the low end all over the place because low end content has a spherical radiation and if you place it in a corner you will uh, excite all modes on all the dimensions in an equal way. When you do so, play some white noise or whatever and you filter it out to keep only low end frequencies and walk in the middle of the room from front to back and try to find the spot where you feel that the low end is the most balanced. Usually this is at more or less three-fifths of the length being from the front wall or from the back wall. Why? This is again linked to physics and to geometry. The modes will be in the length of the room, so of course in the middle, at the quarters, you have multiple of those frequencies that can be problematic. And three-fifths is somehow like in between everything. So that's the first technique. You can just measure and then walking around that measuring point of the three-fifths, you can adjust slightly things in, in order to find the exact listening position. And in fact, this is something I advise doing for any studio because low end is the most difficult thing to control. So it's better to first find the actual spot where you have less of the problems and then build around that. For high frequency, you can make DIY panels. That's not a problem. Okay, so first technique is this, finding the exact position. So now that you have found the exact position in the depth of the studio where you should be located, we can start looking at other options. First of all, forget about any foam and any porous material, even the corner traps that some companies are branding like base trap. I'm talking about the foam ones. There are other options that are valid, but all the foam options are not working. Why? Because porous absorbent is a velocity type of absorbing. Maybe disclaimer, there are two types of absorbing techniques. One is pressure based and the other one is velocity based. The velocity based will actually slow the speed of the sound when it passes through some material. And to be very effective, this velocity absorber, the porous material being rock wool, being polyester wool or whatever, should be placed at a quarter of the wavelength from the back wall because if it's at a quarter of the wave from the back wall the sound will go through bounce to the wall come back at the mid of the waveform mid of the waveform 180 degree is cancellation so actually you are using the foam and the wall to cancel that frequency inside the foam this is how it can reduce a lot but if you think about that as sound is traveling around 340 meters per second mean that that 20 hertz the wavelength is 17 meters 17 meters. So if you want to have a proper treatment with polyester wool or rock wool or whatever at 20 hertz, you should have 17 divided by four, let's four, 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 four and a quarter meters thickness of absorbent material. I mean, if you can afford losing four meters in the length of your studio to treat low end, it's nice, but I don't know many people who can. So this is why the classic DIY panels are never working for this kind of situation. And the problem with classical DIY panels is you want to get a better control on your room. So you start to build more and more panels. While doing so, you will dampen the reverb time and getting a very dry sound in the top end, but the low end will still resonate, turn around and even unbalance things even more because you will feel muddy low end while all the rest is, is crisp and clear. Okay, so forget about any foam and any corner traps that are made out of foam. These are not working. So what can we do? Because velocity is not working, in our case, we can use what we call pressure absorbent. And pressure devices 
are either Helmholtz resonators or membranes. The idea of a membrane is actually that you have a surface that will receive the sound, sound will come through the surface, and the pressure of the sound will make the surface move, and the surface will be tuned to move at the frequency of that sound, eating up the energy. Instead of having the sound bouncing back because the surface is rigid, the surface will move at the speed of that frequency that is problematic and will absorb that energy. So this is what we call tuned traps with mem membranes. The thing is, there are online resources, I will put the link in the description, how to build them and what are the maths behind these, but it's very tricky to build. Why? Because if you are a few centimeters thicker, if, if the membrane is a bit wider, a bit bigger, a bit thicker, and the resonant frequency of the whole device will change as well. So the, what most of the membrane devices work with a membrane and after, and behind the membrane there is some absorbing material like rock wool or, or fiberglass or whatever that will help spread out. So it's not just like one frequency, one point that will be addressed but a wider range and this allows a bit more of margins of error and it allows you to be more gentle with the results. Same goes for Helmholtz resonators. The principle of a Helmholtz is like a bottle of beer. You blow in a bottle, it creates a sound. Well, if the bottle is tuned to the mode of your room, it will absorb that energy, right? So here again, I will put some links in the description to some calculators to do it yourself. But please bear in mind that these are not so easy to build as a classical rock wool panel DIY broadband absorbent. I have friends who tried this and they had to start again a few times before getting it exactly right. So for that reason, I'm not advocating for not doing it DIY, but I think if you are, are in a rush, if you are not so handy, actually buying pre-made panels from known acoustic companies like Geek Acoustics is something that will in fact be less, less expensive why? Because the trial and error will cost you and you will have to start again if you didn't buy it right from scratch. Well, if you buy the panel, they know their devices and their devices are tuned to work on some frequency. As I said, here in the studio, my whole back wall is, is made fully of Geek Scopus membranes that are tuned at 40 Hz, but they have a broader Q. It's not only 40 Hz, but they are meant to tackle really that frequency range. And they have a, a range of panels tackling 40, 70 and 100 Hz. So these are, from, from my personal opinion, one of the best buys you can do because the, the price versus result versus time that you have to take if you do it yourself is the best combo in my humble opinion. I'm not, I have no parts in the company. I'm not pushing you to buy some, but if at some point you want really low quality, low end control for not so much money and that you don't want the hustle going through hours of building your panels yourself and doing some trial and error, I think this is probably the best option available. Lastly, what I also have here at the back are the PSI AVA C214. And what is that? These are those boxes you can see here. What are those things? The AVAs are what we call active bass traps because there's a microphone that is measuring the pressure and the pressure changes. There are speakers inside the columns creating a kind of black hole. One device is covering more or less like one meter and 20 centimeters of, of a perimeter. So it is really like eating up the low end. The main advantage of something like the AVAS is that they are not working just on one frequency. If you are making membrane panels or Helmholtz resonators, they are just targeting one specific frequency. The AVAS, they can work on a bunch of frequency between 20 Hz and 150 Hz. So you don't have the hustle of building anything. Ideally, you should place them in corners. I'm going to talk more about this in a second, but you can just put them in place, turn them on, and it's working. So I think it's a pretty elegant way to work. It has a cost, but also the benefit of it being that it's modular, you can take them out in any studio. If you are building tuned membranes, if at some point you are moving in another place, chances are that the modes will not be the same in another place and so you will not be able to reuse those. Well, with the AVAS, you just take them, you plug them. Even more, you could take them with you if you have a session somewhere else for a certain time and you want to improve the acoustic of the room, just take them with you, right? So Now, about the AVAS. I, I love them, I have to be honest, I love them, but I went through some trial and error. So first thing is the AVAS are working also on sonic pressure. Because the AVAS have a microphone, they react to 
sonic pressure, right? If you place AVAS at a point where there is a dip in a mode, they will not catch any sound and they will not work. So this is why by default, PSI recommends to put them in the corners because this is something, again, you can try by yourself playing some low-end content in your room. As soon as you will get close to the walls, especially in the corner, you will hear an increase of low-end content. This is, again, just physics. So if you place the AVAS, in the corners, chances are that they will be working already pretty decently. I did extensive tests. When I mean extensive, I, I tried, I don't know, like 20 combinations, four in the front, on top of each other, on the back, on the floor, on the sides. I, I really tried everything imaginable and I measured everything with Room EQ Wizard. First thing is I got better measures with having the four of them on the front wall. So why didn't I put them on the front wall? Well, I first measured things. I looked at Rumi Q Wizard and at my decay graphs. You can see it like here. I could see the improvement of the AVAS and I looked where wh what position was giving the best improvement in the decay time. Because this is another important aspect about the low-end control is that modes are cancelling some frequencies out so you don't hear them, but they are also exciting the room and, and they will continue playing sound even when the speaker has stopped because the room is resonating, right? So it means that the decay times are longer. So you will not be able to adjust as precisely your, your compressors and your gates if the room is messing up with the signal. You, because again, you will not hear exactly what you're doing. So low end control helps for the modes and having a sound that is more evened out all across the place. It helps even at the like three fifth position ease out things and having a better frequency response in the low end. But it also helps getting a more linear decay time, making your whole room more cohesive, right? So let's back to the AVAS. I put them at the front wall and this is where I got the best measure, right? So I was like, okay, nice. Here I have a very, very tight and very nice control of my low end. And I started to play some music. And I don't know if it's just because of the AVAS. Maybe it's because I have the key speakers that have this cartridge pattern with several woofers working with DSP control and, and phase shifts. I don't know exactly why, but the thing is my, my, my stereo image in the low end was fucked up. I played some piano track, just stereo mic, and out of a sudden, the piano that I loved, where I was feeling really like inside the piano at first in my studio, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm missing some dimension. It, 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 it fucked things up. So it was better on the measurement for the decay time, but actually the stereo information was somehow fucked up. So I decided to not go for that option. So best option for me was four on the back. Why? Because two on the sides are in the corners. This is where they are the most effective. So why did I add two others in the center? Well, the thing is, first of all, I have my, my, my front window and my back door, while the whole wall is already made of, of membranes. So adding some control just around this vertical line where I have no control helped quite a lot. And also what I realized is, and this was already the case with two AVAS, but even stronger with four, is that once I turn them on now, it's like my back wall disappears acoustically. Sound is coming from the speakers and even in the low end, I have something that is super tight and punchy. It's also something you, you have to get used to bit because it's not usual. Usually when you play something, especially if you play it loud, you are used to be in the bass, right? You have the room that is actually pressuring you because the whole room is resonating. Once I turn those avas on, now even at loud, at loud levels, I just hear the bass coming from the front like the rest of the sounds. And so the bass is cohesive with the highs and it's super tight, super punchy. And I could reduce a lot the decay time in order to get something that is very clear and very clean and where I have now full control over my low end. So little thing also about the AVAS is the microphone is on the top. You have the blue LEDs. Let's say that, that it's a little blue LED there and the microphone is just on top. So if you want, you can also play with putting them upside down. I did some measurements as, as well with that and I didn't see a lot of difference to be honest. And in my case, it worked even better like that, but it's something to keep in mind. Also for vertical modes, I know some people who try to put AVAS on the ceiling and this is working as well. And this is why the new version, the C214, are maybe best suited for this kind of application because the older version, the C20, is quite chunky and heavy. So it's more difficult to try to hang it on the ceiling, but it's very efficient. So long story short, what I would say is start by finding the right position in your room, 
see if you can make panels yourself or buy some gig panels that are working for the frequency problems you have. If you have some doubts on the modal frequency, I also really recommend you checking out Amrock Calculator. I will put also the link in the description. You just type in the dimensions of your room, the length, the width and the height, and it will show you. It's just math. It's, you could do the calculation yourself, but it's doing it for you. You'll see the different modes. And this is very handy because if you drag the mouse above any of those red lines where it sees a mode for your room, it's playing that sound, a pure sine wave. And so you can use that also to listen how your room is reacting to those frequencies. Hover the mouse over that line and walk around in your room and see how how bad actually your room is responding to those frequencies. And so it helps also to realize what frequencies are problematic and to know better your room. And I think maybe this is the last take, even if you can't afford any treatment and if you just chose the right position where you are sitting, it's already improving your sound. But knowing which frequencies are problematic is also very important to know how your room is reacting. In my previous pseudo, I couldn't go so far in acoustic treatment and I knew I had to shift position to check the low end. I had actually two positions. I had my working position and then I had another position where I was like, okay, I know these and these frequencies are problematic, but if I move here, here I have less problems with those frequencies and I have another reference point. And of course, always use headphones and especially headphones with things like Sonarwork to have a profile correction, which then have no acoustic issues and you have a real understanding of what is inside the music and you're listening then to the music, not to your room. So long story short, you should get some low end control for your room after trying this out. I mean, I'm not saying you should get, but you will want to try it out, play some low end content, walk around your room. And I think just doing this is already a first eye opener experience. When I did this the first time I was, oh shit, I never realized that the room was affecting that much my low end content. And now you know that, well, you can make better decisions while mixing or while mastering. I hope this was helpful. I hope it will help you push your music to new heights and I hope to see you soon in another video. Take care and bye-bye.